Welcome, friends, to Understanding the Times. My name is Mark Henry. Turn to someone and say, Welcome. All right. Hey, a special welcome to all of you that are joining us online and literally from all around the country. I want you guys to know this is really amazing. In Matthew 24, Jesus says in the last days the gospel would go around the world. Now, when you look at the context, we know he's talking about the days of the tribulation, the use of the 144,000 and the angelic element of that and the two prophets. But my point is this. You and I are living in a generation where that is happening. No other generation has ever had that experience. So if you're joining us from Asia or Europe, Europe or Africa, I just want to say welcome, uh, and we're excited about what God has for you tonight. Now, as Jen and I have been talking and kind of thinking about uh, tonight, um, both of us are inundated with people saying things like, I'm going insane. How many of you feel like you're going insane? All right. I, I think all of us are feeling that, and tonight I think that you're going to find some real grace from the Lord. And what I always tell people is when you start to feel like you're going insane, you need a, a song and you need a verse. And so tonight I'm going to share a verse with you that God is using in my life to keep me sane. And I pray that it'll keep you sane. Just recently I was in a public setting and there was a, a wonderful lady there, not a follower of Jesus. She had grown up in the church, but she'd left the church. She was in her uh, early 30s. And she leans over to me, kind of looking around so that no one would hear her. And she says this, Mark, are we living in the last days? I think I'm going crazy. And I said, we are living in the last days. You're not going crazy, but you need the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey tonight, but don't go crazy. Look to the Lord. God has the answers. Now, really quick, before Jan comes tonight, she's going to start us off tonight. But before she comes, let me just kind of quickly give you the outline for the night. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then Jan's going to come. And then I'm going to share a couple of thoughts after that. And then we have Corey Ten Boom with us. And I think your hearts are going to be encouraged because talk about a family making it through difficult times and doing it in a sane way. And one of the key elements that you're going to see tonight throughout all of this is that you can't follow the idol of safety and be sane. You know, today we always say to people, hey, be safe, be safe. Friends, Americans have bought into the idolatry of safety. Amen. Jesus didn't play it safe. He followed the living God. And I want to say to you tonight, if you want to keep your sanity, follow the Lord Jesus Christ rather than the idolatry of safety. As Jen comes tonight, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I just pray that you be with my friends tonight. Help us to be a blessing to one another. Help us to encourage one another because you are great. God, keep us sane as we follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's welcome Jan Markell. Okay. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Chilly Minnesota winter. And I'm just going to uh, make a few kind of introductory remarks and um, refer to a few items back on the table and, and make some other general comments here. Because we're really tonight looking back at history, but we're not stopping by looking back at history. We're going to try to apply it to today and how some of the things from history are reliving themselves. And it, oh, my goodness, is it difficult to see as we watch tyranny rise? If we talk about um, well, parallels to 80 years ago. Did you ever think some of those parallels would be happening now in the 21st century? We're going to talk about some of those things tonight. We're going to try to emphasize some of the good news. The best news of all is the king is coming, and maybe today, and, and I hope that's an encouragement to you. Um, and we're, we're looking at a time in history that is admittedly dark, and that would have been, well, it started obviously in the 30s into the 40s. And the terrible ordeal known as the Holocaust, God used it for good because the state of Israel was born out of the ashes of the Holocaust. The world, including places like the Soviet Union, voted in 1948 because of what they had seen, because they saw the images from the Holocaust, they voted yes, Israel needs to be an independent sovereign nation with her own land. 
Now that alone is a miracle when you can get some of the nations, <laughs> some of the darkest nations of the world uh, to vote in favor of that at the United Nations. And our president at the time, Harry Truman, was one of the first to cast a yes vote at the United Nations for an independent sovereign state of Israel. So how does kind of what we're talking about tonight um, ta uh, apply to, to so-called last days, the Bible calls the end times, the last days, time of Jacob's trouble, etc. And the question I'm asking, which we don't have an answer for, is uh, back then, 80 years ago, we were looking at fascism. Today, I would say uh, it's socialism and Marxism that has risen. What is the Antichrist going to be? I think he's going to be a little bit of a fascist, a communist, a socialist, Marxist. He's going to be very evil. Of course, the church is not going to be here to experience him. Uh, so I, I just think that um, what we saw in the Holocaust, and by the way, and there are many, many videos, both online and other places, where we can see in detail exactly what happened at that time in the 30s and the 40s. You know, Dwight Eisenhower liberated some of the camps, and the soldiers, including Ike, could not believe. They said their imagination wasn't strong enough to comprehend what mankind was doing. And mainly to the Jews, there were others that were thrown in, in the camps as well, but it's heavily Jews, but there were some others. But the imagination couldn't grasp that mankind could do this to a people who have been a blessing to the whole world. So we want to consider some of that today. Um, Holocaust survivors, if they are fading, some of you know the one I worked with for literally 40 years. And I did bring her book in, on the back table, Anita Dittman, uh, Trapped in Hitler's Hell. I'm going to say just a little bit about that in here in just a minute or two because I want to show the trailer to the DVD, but not quite yet. But the Lord allowed me to meet Anita. Actually, it was a pastor from, I believe it was Hope Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis, a suburb of Minneapolis. And he called me in, I think it was 1979, and he said, I just served communion to somebody in, a, in the hospital. Her name is Anita. And she needs a book written about her, Jan, and I think you need to do it. And so I wrote that in 79, 80. It came out in 81. Now, what I find interesting is Corey Ten Boom's ministry, she passed away at 80, uh, in 1983. And Anita's ministry started in 1981. And I really think Anita stepped in and filled the gap left by Corey when she passed away in 83 because the, the uh, impact that Corey had on the world is just remarkable. So I'll say more about that product here in just a moment. But uh, here, the thing I want to emphasize tonight is you're going to be seeing both by way of video and certainly by the presentation by Evelyn, is you're going to be seeing um, I would say some remnants of Holland. Keep in mind that Holland during the war was heavily, almost exclusively, a replacement theology country in their church. Now what does that mean? That means that the church in Holland embraced the fact that the church had replaced Israel. There really was no special role for the Jews. But then came the Ten Boom family, who, was, who were willing to literally die for the preservation and safety of the Jews as they hid the incredible film, 1975 film, The Hiding Place, and that, which was shown here two, uh, two uh, weeks ago. Um, and, and the stunning, stunning story of the Ten Boom family, who went against the grain because they knew that if some, some had to become righteous Gentiles and try to save a remnant of the Jews, which they did. So um, there's a saying I like to use now and then. I don't even know who wrote it. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but not so odd as those who choose the Jewish God, but spurn the Jews. And that's most churches. And personally, I believe that's why many of the churches are not flourishing today, because they've chosen to set aside 
an interest, a care, a concern uh, for understanding the things that some of the things we're even going to talk about tonight. I want to show a real quick clip here. It's about three minutes, and let me explain. I am deeply concerned that this topic is fading off the scene. It's, it's only 80 years old. It's not like it's the Civil War or Revolutionary War. It's not that long ago. It's fading. It's not being taught in our schools. And it's being quickly forgotten. It's a tremendous burden that I happen to feel about this, this topic tonight. So I want to show a quick three-minute clip. The gal's name is Rhonda Fink Whitman. She's the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. And she has gone to various colleges. And she's asking these college students, and she's quick to say, we're not going to play it. Look, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but folks, I want you to see if life goes on, we have another 20 years, there won't be anybody who will know, and by the way, it won't go on 20 years, <laughs> don't worry, uh, there won't be anyone left to see or care or know or remember what happened. Let's play that little clip. Where did the Holocaust happen? I have no idea. Where did it start? Which country? I have no idea. Europe? No. Is it Europe? I don't think so. <laughs> Which country was Adolf Hitler the leader of? I think it's Amsterdam. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I forget. About how many years ago do you think? Um. Older too. Is that like 1800? Or I want to say like 300 years ago, maybe? What were the prison camps called? Common, what are they commonly known as? I know this. I don't remember. Uh, begins with a C. Concentration camps. <laughs> there you go. Can you name one? No. Not one. Nope. Can you name a concentration camp? No. What was Auschwitz? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. What was the night of broken glass? I don't know. What was the night of broken glass? I do not know. I don't know. What were the Nuremberg laws? Once again, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know that one. What were the Nuremberg trials? I don't know. What was the significance of a ship called the St. Louis? Don't know. Which United States president was responsible for sending a boatload of Jews back to a certain death in Europe? Not sure. Never heard that one. I don't know. Have you ever heard that before? No, I haven't. Did you look surprised when I said that? You never heard that story? No, I didn't. I've never heard it. I have no idea. What was the final solution? I don't know. Uh, I think it was uh, just at the end of the World War II. They just, uh, the, it was the Nuremberg trials against the uh, war crimes against the uh, Nazi party. Um, what do you mean by final solution? What, what's, what was his plan that he called the final solution? Oh, I don't know then. Do you know how many Jews were murdered? Uh, I'm not sure. I want to say, I want to say three million, but I'm, I'm, I have no idea. Higher. Higher? Is it, uh, 300? No. Hundreds of thousands. <laughs> That'd be my best guess. Um, I want to say like a million. I'm not sure. Uh, what other groups were targeted besides Jewish people? Um, the African Americans. Here in the United States, they used to be like discriminated because skin color and like the whites, especially American people, they used to like um, put them aside because. Of what What about in Europe? Who did the Nazis target besides the Jews in Europe? I don't know. What type of experiments were done on prisoners of Auschwitz? I don't know. What did they do to twins in Auschwitz? I have no idea. 
So does that bother you at all? It does me. And what this Fink Whitman, Rhonda Fink Whitman is trying to do is trying to get the Holocaust taught in all of our high schools. And that's been successful in five states only. Pennsylvania, I can't think of the others, but five states out of all the states in America, only five are even teaching anything about this kind of history. And so it's going to be very easy to repeat itself, which I maintain is happening in a little different fashion here as we speak. Um, I want to call your attention to just a few things on the table, and only because I think it'll further equip you to understand the times, which is why we do these things. And we gave you a little handout that talks about each product, so I'm not going to do that. The, what I am going to emphasize, again, I'm going back to the Dittman products and her book, Trapped in Hitler's Hell, which I think the Lord has allowed to live for 40 years. It never happens. Just as Corey's story has lived forever. Anita, Anita passed away a year ago. It's, I believe it's going to live forever. And then the DVD, and I'm going to play the trailer only because I want you to meet Anita, who's now enjoying heaven. And I worked with her for so many years. And again, she made a huge impact, uh, just as Corey did. Can we just play the trailer to this little film we have back there? I had a whole list of undesirables, and the Jews were at the top list. And as soon as the teacher would know who the undesirables were, life could be very miserable. This teacher, Fräulein Kinzel, she was a super Nazi, and she just made life almost unbearable. Early on in Hitler's uh, government, my father left us. He was the Aryan. He didn't want to be married to a Jew. When the principal, he said, did not that due to my Jewish heritage, I was permanently suspended from school. It's high time that the German government is going to uh, cleanse our school system of refresh such as yourself. And then uh, Evelyn has two books back there, The Weaving, which kind of explains how all of this came about, her ministry here, and then Loving Israel 101, The Jewish People and God's Promises. So if you'd like to get in, and tons of other things on the table, including our magazine. Now, I want to read one verse, and then I'm going to stop. And the verse comes out of Jeremiah 16, chapter 16, verse 16. You know, a lot of people ask, why didn't the Jews get out of Europe? They were encouraged to get out by the Zionists. They were encouraged to get out by Christians. They, it, their handwriting was on the wall in the 20s. By the early 30s, it was pretty obvious. And they could have fled. Very few did. If you had the money, some of them fled. Most didn't have the money, but most didn't want to flee. They didn't have the imagination to imagine what was going to happen throughout the 30s into the mid-40s. But there's one verse that I believe talks about it in Jeremiah 16, 16. So all I'm going to read is one verse. Behold, I am sending for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rock. We believe that the fishermen were in fact the Zionists who said to the Jews, go, flee, 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 get out, get out, get out, and they wouldn't go. And God allowed the hunters to come 
for his eternal purposes. And again, state of Israel was reborn because of a sympathy vote. The hunters came and hunted the Jews from every mountain, every hill, and out of the clefts of the rock. You'll see some of that tonight and hear about some of that tonight, but hopefully we're going to focus on things that are, are more encouraging for the evening. And I think, um, we're, I think what Mark would like to start with would be another quick little film here. And that is, you know, people ask, again, how did it happen? How did anybody let it happen? And how, how did it play out? It played out gradually and then suddenly. So here is, a, I believe this gentleman is about 100 years old. He's a survivor. It's a fascinating clip. I happened to see it the other night. The whole, I think it's five, six minutes. We're just showing, I think, two minutes here. A survivor, and he's talking about it started here, and then it inched here, and then it inched here, and then they took more ground, and then they took a little bit more ground, and it, it eventually it's full on, full blown, night of broken glass. Why don't we play that clip? Early 1930s. <laughs> You can read an inscription on the benches. Jews must not sit on these benches. You could say it's unpleasant, it's not fair, it's not right. But after all, there are so many benches around. You can sit somewhere else. Of course you can. What comes up later is an order, really more an, of an order than of an inscription. Non-Aryan children must not play with Aryan children, with the German children. All right, they'll play on their own. And then you read, we only sell bread and food to Jews after 5 p.m., right? less choice, this makes your life harder. But after all, after 5 p.m. you can still do your shopping. Now I warn you, I warn you, I'm getting used to a thought, that thought that someone may be excluded becomes mediated into our lives. The thought that somebody can be stigmatized, that someone may be alienated. And that's how it is done, step by step. And that's how it's done, step by step. I, you know, growing up, uh, my, my dad committed suicide when I was five years old. And my mom made the hardest decision of her life, or one of them, and that was to send me to live with my grandfather. And my grandfather uh, introduced me to a lot of people. I'm going to share some of those stories with you tonight. But I kept asking, how could this happen in Germany? These were educated people. This was uh, one of the most advanced uh, cultures of the day with the highest educated individuals. In fact, even today, we look back from a military standpoint and still copy a lot of the engineering and the advancements that they had. But how in the world could they kill six million Jews? Well, my grandfather, who was born in 1922, who was raising me, said, the thing you have to worry about tyranny, it will come in one of two, day, two ways. It will either come like it did in Germany, where it's a slow sort of step-by-step -step progression. Now, if we showed the whole video clip that goes on for maybe about 45 minutes of Martin, he would describe there how the Jews uh, saw signs up. Jews not welcome to sit on this bench. Jews not welcome to swim in this pool. Jews not welcome to shop in this, this store. And then it turns to mandates. And then things rapidly changed in Germany. So that was the first thing my grandfather warned me about. And he said the second way tyranny comes is what Hitler did in Poland, where they attacked the country, overpowered it in two weeks, and that's why you've got to have a strong military. That's why every country has to have a strong military. But the danger will be in the United States, he said. 
is the slow sort of tyranny that comes. He warned me about that. Now, my grandfather, I remember one time we were, we were together. I think we were in his old red Datsun pickup truck. At least that's what I have in my mind. And there was someone talking on the radio, and they were talking about World War II, and they were talking about the Holocaust. And one of the uh, individuals speaking on the radio said, the Holocaust never happened. The Jews weren't killed. And I remember my grandfather almost pulling the steering wheel off in total frustration. And he said, Mark, remember this. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was a general of the Allied forces, when he heard about the concentration camps, walked through them and told the, the crews, the camera crews, come and I want you to film all of this. I want you to record it. I want you to get all the witnesses. We cannot let this be missed in history. And then he looked at me and said, Mark, you cannot let this be missed in history. You know, my grandfather was a pretty amazing guy. Serving in World War II, all of the friends that we'd have, we'd sit around the dinner table at night. And, uh, and then his friends, they were all in their 50s. Now, I'm an eight-year-old. All my friends were in their 50s. All of them had served in World War II. I didn't play with eight-year-olds. I played with 55-year-olds. But you know what? They gave me such an education. They talked about Iwo Jima, Saipan. They talked about D-Day. They talked about liberating concentration camps. And they quite honestly gave me a historical perspective that you just can't get from people who haven't been there. I'm so indebted for that. One of the individuals that my grandfather introduced me to was Eliezer. Eliezer lived next door to us. Uh, he was a, a Jewish man uh, who had gone through the Holocaust. And we were fishing one night uh, for catfish. And my grandfather looked at him and said, you should tell Mark your story. He was just a small boy at the time when the Germans had overrun Poland. They'd come into his, uh, to his, to his uh, city and they started gathering up the Jews. Now his, his, his parents had heard about these SS uh, firing squads. And they said, now if, if we get gathered up, you hide behind us. And if we fall down, you just, you just lay very still. Well, sure enough, one afternoon, the Nazis came, gathered them up with a bunch of other Jews, ran them to this pit, and he said they were several deep. And his parents were there, and uh, he was pushed behind his, his mother, and his sister was pushed behind father, and they started shooting, and he said, my parents fell, and we just fell underneath them, and we laid very still. And he said they were looking down into the pit, and they were just shooting indiv individuals if they were moving. And he said, I just laid there as still as I could, just hoping that they wouldn't notice me. He said it eventually got dark. It was in the afternoon. It got dark, and then my sister crawled out called to me, and, and, and he says, I don't even know how. Now, he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in Jesus. He was an atheist. He just, I don't know how it happened. It was a miracle. Well, miracles happen because there's a God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had made it to the United States, and he was our neighbor. My grandfather introduced me to other individuals, such as Carl. Carl was a German U-boat commander uh, during World War II, and uh, one day we were out fishing for salmon together, and my grandfather said to him, Carl, you should tell him your story. And so he started telling me about his role in Germany and how he became, uh, got into the military, and then how he was this German U-boat commander and trying to keep the shipping that was happening from the United States to uh, Great Britain. And as he was telling that story, eventually I asked him the question. I said, Carl, how did you ever get involved with that? I mean, six million Jews died. And I remember his, his response. His response was, I started out as a Hitler youth. And Mark, we didn't know. We were just kids. I mean, he was born in the 20s, ushered right into Hitler's youth. You only know what you know. And, and he said, it's horrible once we found out, but now what do we do? That's the way things work. Information is powerful. 
Well, as I continued to get a little older, I noticed that anti-Semitism wasn't just something in the past. Anti-Semitism is something in the present. In fact, even just the last few weeks, if you've been watching in the news at all, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're on a college campus, there's anti-Semitism. Uh, the anti-Semitism that's all over Europe and France and, uh, and England and Jews are flocking back to Israel. Uh, if you think back about 1880, there was about 23,000 Jews roughly in the, in, in the land of Israel, the promised land. Uh, today, about 43% of all Jews live in the land. And there's this movement back. And I do think that God will use this anti-Semitism around the world to move the Jewish people back to the promised land. But you know, I've been in Israel many times, and I tell you, they live with neighbors who make lots of threats. The Iranians, just about 10 days ago, uh, one of their generals was discussing their view of Israel. And in the Jerusalem Post, uh, he made it very clear that their ambition is to destroy Israel, to destroy Zionism, and they were not going to back off one inch. That's the reason why when presidents in the West negotiate with them, we think that they want to have some level of peace. That's not the goal. The goal is to eradicate the Jewish people. That's the facts. And you can whitewash that if you will, but that's the facts. And you say, why is there this anti-Semitism? Why is there this hate for Israel? And it wasn't until I trusted Jesus as my Savior and started reading the Bible, I was able to understand the conflict. I want to share with you from the Bible a couple of verses. Um, these three verses um, are each 500 years apart. So the first verse is found in the book of Deuteronomy. It was roughly 15 100 BC, so 1500 years before Jesus, during the days of Moses. It says this, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God didn't change his plan. A thousand years before Jesus, during the days of David, Psalm 135 verse 4, the Lord has chosen Israel for his own possession. Another 500 years closer to Jesus, one of the exilic prophets, Zechariah, he wrote this, For thus says the Lord, He who uh, touches you touches the apple of my eye. And the reality is, is that God has made certain promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And friends, you and I are the benefactors of that. God had three specific things that he was moving uh, in the creation of the Jewish people. One, that Abraham's descendants would be the ones who had the responsibility to make sure that we had the Bible. I mean, if you think about it, all of the writers, virtually all of the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament are Jews. That was the plan of God. They were given the responsibility to bring the oracles of God to the world. The second was that they were supposed to bring the Savior. Jesus Christ is, after all, Lion of Judah, son of David, descendant of Abraham. And so you see that the scriptures and Jesus, uh, well, that was God's plan. In the book of Romans, we find another one, and that is that Israel was supposed to be a light unto the nations, that when they followed God, they would find God's blessing, and then that would be an example to all of the nations of the world. And as a result of that uh, choosing, God's choosing of them, Satan hates them. Now, uh, quite honestly, you know, you think about it, if, if there's this conflict between God and Satan and God plans to do something, Satan is going to do everything he can to impede, stop, resist, oppose. And so all through history, you have this opposition against the Jewish people. I mean, just think about it in the Bible. Exodus chapter 3, we find a guy by the name of Pharaoh, and what's he trying to do? Eradicate the children, eradicate the Jewish people. Or we look a little farther during the days of Esther. And you remember Haman comes along and he's got a plan to eradicate the Jews. A few years later, we have Antiochus Epiphanes come along and his goal is to eradicate the Jews again. And then 70 AD, Titus comes and destroys Jerusalem. And often we talk about him destroying the temple. But keep this in mind. He killed a million Jews and carried off 200,000 as slaves. And then we have 
the days of Hitler. Now, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in between, but my point is this, is that history is filled of this resistance. God says, you're my chosen ones. I'm going to bless you. And Satan brings all of these different groups and people groups to attack, to destroy, to maim. And yet, in the providence of God, he preserves a remnant always through it all. Now, here's something that's stunning. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, as bad as all of those things were, there's a day that's coming even worse. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. But the good news is, at the end of time of Jacob's trouble, when they're just about ready to wipe Jerusalem off the map, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Zechariah 14, will come in the clouds just like he left, and he will rescue Israel. And the book of Romans says, and all of Israel on that day will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him and have everlasting life. And then in the goodness of God, Abraham will be raised, Isaac will be raised, and Jesus will establish a millennial kingdom. And at long last, God's promise to the Jewish people because of their responsibility to bring the Bible, bring the Savior, be a light to the nations, the blessing of that will be for a thousand years and on into eternity. God's pretty amazing. And Jesus is coming. Now, I would suggest to you tonight, the things that we see happening in Germany may be repeating themselves in our, in our generation. In fact, Jan and I were just having lunch the other day, and she said, you know, Mark, it seems this step-by-step -step scenario. How many of you remember 15 days to slow the spread? Do you all remember that? How many of you know this, is, this, this has gone on longer than 15 days? And then it was just like another 15 days, right? I mean... But then start to think about how it's affected everybody's life, everybody's jobs, everybody's families, and a lot of things have changed. I want you to see what's happened just recently, the last couple of days in the newspaper. Here's an example. Um, Austria and uh, them throwing out their constitution. Why? All that matters is COVID restrictions and mandates. Um, vaccine holdouts face uh, $4,000 fines. Um, Greece uh, is, is uh, mandating uh, vaccines for those who are 60 and older. And if you don't, there's a consequence for doing that. You're going to be paying the price. Germany, the same way, is uh, threatening these mandates. Now, before they were suggestions, we encourage you to get it. We'll pay you to get it. How many remember, how many of you got a text saying, we'll give you $100 if you go get it? Right? But these things, these things move step by step, and they move from suggestions or ideas or encouragements or payoffs to threats. Maybe you saw in the last couple of weeks the, uh, uh, the prime minister of New Zealand. Now, she's asked two questions. It's a little hard to hear this, but she's asked two questions, and I want you to understand them. The first question is this. Are these mandates creating a two-tier society? The second question she's going to ask is, or it's going to be asked of her, is um, are these uh, passports that we're starting to require, what is really the intention? Is that to slow the spread, or what is that purpose? Listen to this answer. So you basically see it. This is going to be like, well, it's almost like, uh, you probably don't see it like this, the two different classes of people. If you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, you have all these rights. If you are vaccinated... That is what it is. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Can you describe as you were previously hoping not to be able to, not to have to do that, I guess, when we still mm. like we could maintain elimination across the whole country? I guess that has now changed because... I think it was less, less because necessarily of the elimination determining that and more because we, of course... Uh, maintained and actually we have managed very high vaccination rates generally without the use of certificates but actually what it's become clear to me is that they're not just a tool to drive up vaccines they're a tool for confidence people who have been vaccinated will want to know that they're around other vaccinated people uh, they want to know that they're in a safe environment it is a way that we can give confidence to those who are going back into hospitality or events uh, and so that is something that I think we should offer to people who have been vaccinated, that confidence that we're doing everything we can to keep them safe and that they can come back out and start enjoying those things safely. I don't know if you caught that, but she said emphatically, yes, we are creating a two-tier society. That is exactly what the Germans did. 
And the second thing is, why have the, the passports? This is why. Because we want one tier to feel safe and secure. Friends, think about the implications of that. The others don't have the right to feel safe and secure. We're not concerned about their rights or how they feel. It is a terrifying statement. If you keep on looking, you might find uh, the 400,000 jobs that Australia has lost. Or maybe you've heard about Howard Springs. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time I heard about Howard Springs. It's built, built to uh, hold people uh, in quarantine, and it holds 2,000 people. And I'm, as, as soon as I heard it, I thought, wow, is this how this went when they started building concentration camps? Now, I want you to hear the testimony of a young lady that got to spend 14 days there on a vacation. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. You feel like you're in prison. You feel like you've done something wrong. It's inhumane what they're doing. Like, you, you are so small. You, they just overpower you, and you're literally nothing. It's like, you do what we say, or you're in trouble, we'll lock you up for longer. Yeah, they were even threatening me that if I was to do this again, we will extend your time in here. Hello, and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. Australia. Until recently, that country was most famous for its sunshine and relaxed attitude. Well, since the COVID pandemic hit, we've all got to know another side of Australia. With some of the longest and most stringent lockdowns and travel restrictions in the world, it's become a case study of what happens when a government will do anything to keep COVID numbers low. Their latest policy is to build special camps, COVID internment camps, to which infected and suspected infected people are moved. The biggest of these camps is called Howard Springs. It houses up to 2,000 inmates, surrounded by tall fences and carefully policed against attempts to escape. It's been described as the gold standard of such camps and is being replicated across Australia. Joining us today on the line from Darwin in the Northern Territories is Hayley Hodgson. She has just returned from a 14-day, let's say, stay at Howard Springs, and she's agreed to tell us all about it. Hi, Hayley. Hi, how are you going? So we are really keen to just hear what's happened to you. It sounds like you've had quite an interesting last couple of weeks. Take us right back to the beginning. How did this all start? Okay, so how it all started was um, a friend of mine went to work and got tested for COVID. He had a little bit of a cold. He tested positive. He got put into this quarantine camp. Um, and then we went about our days as normal. And then the investigators starting to knock on our doors and stuff like that. Um, so then what actually happened was I had investigators come. I walked out the front. Just, of just to interrupt you. So how did they investigate you? Were, were, were you part of a contact tracing kind of list? Or? So they... What they did is how they contacted me was I have a scooter and they ran my number plate and they ran the number plates and seen the footage that I was with the person who had tested positive and that's how they knocked on my door and knew where I lived from running my number plates. Okay. So then do they call you up or did they come straight to the house or what happens next? Yeah, so they came straight to my house. I didn't get a call or anything. I literally walked out the front and it was two undercover investigators. And they said, oh, do you know so-and-so? I said, yes. They said, have you been with them? I said, yep. I told them my whereabouts, where I'd been, everything like that. And they said, no worries. And they said, had you had a COVID test done? I said, yes, I had when I had it just because I was so scared of in the moment and I've been to one of these quarantine camps before, only literally a month before this. So I know what it was like. I was just really scared. It was just a horrible position to be in. And I just, I just lied and said, look, yeah, I have when I had, they said, you know, they, they drove off about five minutes later, they called me and they said, we've tried to check the system and your name's nowhere. We can't find you. And I said, look, I've lied to you. I'm completely sorry. I, I'm so apologetic. You know, I'm I'm scared. I don't want to, you know, this is just such a scary thing. Um, and they said, yep, righto, stay there. Someone's going to come and test you. I said, all right. So I stayed there and I just waited for someone to come and test me. 
no one came to test me. The next people who rocked up at my house were two other police officers. They blocked my so driveway. These are, these are actually uniformed police officers, normal yeah. police officers. Yeah. So then the police officers blocked my driveway. I walked out and I said, what's going on? Are you guys testing me for COVID? What's happening? They said, no, you're getting taken away and you have no choice. You're going to Howard Springs. Um, you either come with us now um, and we'll put you in the back of the Divi van, so or you can have a choice to get a COVID cab. So, of course, I chose the COVID cab because they said, well, if we're to take you, we're going to um, hand you a $5,000 fine. So, of course, I didn't want that to happen. So I just said, look, I don't consent to this. I don't, I don't understand why I can't just self-isolate at home like a lot of other people are doing. Um, and they just said, we've just been told from higher up where to take you and that's all that there is. So Howard Springs is the biggest COVID camp in Australia, isn't it? It's a Correct. huge yeah. network of cabins that is built to house potentially infected people. Yeah, so they are literally bringing in now hundreds of people that are of close contact or that have COVID. So it doesn't even matter if you test negative on your first test, your second or your third. They need to, because you're a close contact, you have to stay in there for 14 days, no matter what. No matter what, would it affect, affect churches? Is any of this affecting churches? You've been following what's happening in Canada with um, Grace Life Church, I trust. But I want you to understand this, that the church in Canada and other parts of the world may look more in the near future like the church in China. Why? Because of this step-by-step -step process. And remember this, when that happens, there's always going to be some churches that follow. In fact, in Berlin, there's this massive church that dates back pre-Hitler. And right on the pulpit, there's an SS trooper on the pulpit in front of it. See, that church followed along with the process. And I would suggest to you that's going to be a danger that your church, our church, every church is going to face potentially in the days ahead. Listen to this from October. Good morning, church, and happy Sunday. When we reopened in July, we and all United Methodist churches throughout the Pacific Northwest, we all agreed to follow the guidelines provided by local, state, and national authorities concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. We also promise not to avail ourselves of any exceptions in those guidelines that are allowed for religious organizations. We also agreed to take the most cautious path forward. Well, this week on Tuesday, the administrative council leaders of our church followed a recommendation from our own reimagined church task force to require proof of COVID-19 vaccination or a neg negative COVID uh, test within 72 hours or a medical exemption to attend in-person worship or events within our building. Now this requirement applies only to those who are eligible to be vaccinated and begins Sunday, October 31st. This requirement follows the King County Health Department's new mandate, which, remember, church, we agreed months ago to follow. The goals of this decision are simple. Keep the church spaces and events as safe as possible for all people and to encourage all eligible people to get vaccinated. So church is for those who um, have followed the regulations of the state all of those who would qualify. Well, I don't know if you got the text I did from the state of Minnesota that said, good news, five-year-olds now qualify. And so you can imagine the tension that's gonna be created. How do you keep from losing your mind? Just really quick, I wanna give you this verse. Uh, this verse is keeping me from losing my mind in the midst of all the news. Listen, you and I, friends, can't change the step-by-step -step things that are maybe happening around us, but what we can do is not follow the idol of safety, but follow courageously the Lord Jesus Christ. And this passage is keeping me sane through it all, and I pray that it'll keep you sane, whatever happens uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, if Jesus tarries. Here it is, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever, 
Amen. Now I want you to think about this passage with me for just a second because the Apostle Paul has been thrown into jail. He spent 30 years preaching Jesus. I mean, he's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten many, many times. He's been uh, stoned once. He's been shipwrecked. He's been starved, threatened. Um, he's a citizen of Rome. I mean, he's been beaten even though he was a citizen. He's ha in a house arrest for two years in Caesarea. And everyone is waiting for the bribes to start so that he can get out. And he's unwilling to do that. He ends up writing a portion of the New Testament, five books to us. We call it the prison epistles. It's amazing. And here now, at the end of his life, he writes Timothy and says, Timothy, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I'm done. And yet he's sane while he's in jail. Would you be sane if you were in jail? Would you be sane if you were in a concentration camp? Would you be sane if you were in Howard Springs? You should be, and so should I. Why? Because this verse is true. You see, the Apostle Paul had grabbed a hold of the truth, the truth that we see in the book of Psalms, that I have put my trust in God. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now I want you to think with me through, just, through this text just really quick. Number one is this. Notice there his focus is on the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to go insane through these days. You see, the Apostle Paul uh, didn't start out as a follower of Jesus. If you remember in the book of Acts in chapter 9, there's a story about him persecuting the church. He was one of the government officials that was trying to close down churches. In fact, he was sent to Damascus to close down a church there of people gathering together in Jesus' name and worshiping him. And you remember the Lord Jesus Christ showed up at that moment along that road, knocked him off a donkey. Listen, don't get knocked off a donkey. No. All right? No. Knocked off a donkey and he falls on the ground and he's like, Lord, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And he says, what must I do now? And he says, and he says, uh, go to Damascus and wait there. He ends up trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. He ends up preaching Jesus the, the next 30 years. Listen, this man had a personal experience with Jesus Christ that gave him a relationship with God that made him the, the St. Paul that we all talk about. My question is this to you. Do you have a relationship with the living God through the person of Jesus Christ? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. This is the one that Peter said as he stood before a government council, the Sanhedrin, and he said, there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. That's how we get a relationship with God. If you and I are going to be sane through all this, we need a relationship with the living God, and it's done through Jesus Christ. If you haven't believed in him, do so tonight. The second thing I want you to see is there's two things that the Lord is going to do for the Apostle Paul as he's sitting in prison, as he's in chains, as he's sitting there waiting to be executed. He's one going to rescue him from how many evil deeds? Every evil deed. Friends, you and I live in an evil fallen world. Now, God in his grace gave this thing called human government to suppress evil. But we also know as we read through scriptures that governments become evil and rather than oppressing evil and giving praise to those who do right, they do the exact opposite over time. And they oppress those who do good and they give praise to those who do evil. And when God sees that, God protects his people and he judges those nations. Every nation should fear God because their job is to suppress evil and to bless those who are doing right. Well, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 18, 7, Woe to the world because of the stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks would come, but woe to the man through whom they come. You see, you and I need to follow Jesus. Don't play it safe. He is the one who is our rescuer. Second thing I want you to notice there is the Lord who will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Friends, you remember what Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. See, the apostle Paul was sitting there in chains with the concept that God is going to deliver me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, driving around Minnesota in the winter is not safe. I don't know about you. We've hit deer. We've, we've slid off the road. We've had other people slide and hit us. It's not safe to travel, but it is safe to travel with Jesus. He is going to deliver us safely to his heavenly kingdom. And then what's the response to this glorious doxology? He says there um, to the praise and glory 
be to him forever and ever. Listen, if you don't want to lose your mind, if you want to keep your sanity, you got to get a relationship with God. You got to remember he is your rescuer. You got to remember he is the one who's going to deliver us safely to his heavenly kingdom. Friends, I would beg you, I would plead with you to memorize this verse. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to own this verse because the days are coming, complex days. Uh, the situation that we're in is, I don't see it becoming more lax. Someone said to me the other day, if I hear Dr. Fauci speak one more time, I'm going to jump off a bridge. <laughs> and I said, I'm going with you. And then I reminded him of this verse. This verse is so important. Paul did not go insane. Why? Because he knew it was the Lord who was his rescuer. It's the Lord who will deliver him safely. And you and I can hold on to the same truth. Here is something that's amazing. Have you ever been with someone and they talk about the good old days? You know, the good old days, the good old days. Do you realize that there is no one who trusts in Jesus Christ today? Finding the blessing of God in heaven will ever look back and say, wow, 2020, 2021, those were the good old days. <laughs> They're never going to say that. But hear me, those who reject Jesus Christ, when they step into eternity, apart from God in a place called hell, you know what they're going to say? Man, 2020, 2021, those were the good old days. The question is, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> would you pray with me? Father, I just pray that you would give us grace during these days. Help us to walk in truth. Help us to turn away from evil. And if you're here tonight or you're listening, let me just ask you a question. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? You're going to go insane without him. You need Jesus Christ to wash away your sins, make you acceptable to God. Right now, would you call on his name? To say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I don't understand everything, but I get it. You died for me. You died on the cross. You paid for my sins. I'm asking you right now to wash away my sins. The best I know how, I trust in you right now. God, hear our prayers. Help us to draw near to you. Help us to be sane. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, hey, February 10th, we're going to be having another gathering. Uh, before Corey comes, though, I want to introduce you to our speaker, our guest speaker on February 10th, Tom Hughes. Watch this. Uh, they are praising him for salvation because salvation belongs to the Lord. They are praising him for glory because glory belongs to the Lord. They are praising him for honor because honor belongs to the Lord. Uh, the day is almost here when we will recognize more fully than ever before that glory and honor, salvation and glory and honor belong to him. I mean, uh, imagine it. You're going to be safely home because you got saved. I made it. Wow. I wasn't so sure. Well, I wasn't so sure about you either. But you know, God was. God, no, I'm, I'm joking. Right? It's just a joke. Some people online are going to say, you're so mean. I see you. Whatever. But in that moment, salvation and glory and honor belong to him. In that moment, every worry, every trouble that you ever had, uh, you will know with absolute certainty that you will never have trouble again. You're safely home. There's no more debts, no more worries, no more fears, no more broken hearts, no death, sadness, bullying, persecution, suffering, sickness, troubles, car payments, rent, taxes, politics, politics, politics. <laughs> No more bad news, no more sins or temptations. They will forever be gone, and we will praise the Lord, and our praise will be more infinitely incredible than we could ever imagine now. Pastor Tom Hughes of 412 Church, San Jacinto, California. He is going to be with us February 10th. Make sure you get in your calendar. Uh, he's a longtime personal friend of both Olive Tree Ministry and Mark Henry Ministries, and you're going to be greatly blessed. Now, tonight we are going to have an offering and I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, our last two events, because of your generosity, has reached nearly 400,000 people around the world. And as I was reflecting on that this last week, Matthew 24 came to mind. Jesus says in the last days that the gospel would reach around the world. And when I started ministry, I thought, well, maybe that's sending out missionaries. And then, you know, just because of travel being so easy, I thought, well, maybe it's because we're able to travel. But here we are meeting in Minnesota tonight 
and we are reaching around the world. We have friends watching in Australia, we have friends watching in New Zealand, we have friends uh, in different parts of Asia, we have friends in Europe and Africa, all over North America. This is amazing. We are living in the last days and literally the gospel is going around the world tonight. So thank you for giving, thank you for participating in that. If you're joining us on the stream tonight or watching this later, you can go to Mark Henry Ministries. There's a donate button up on the top right. Uh, I just want to encourage you, give generously there. You can uh, give, and it's safe, secure, and it's easy. Uh, so thank you for your help. If you're live in the room tonight, just make your checks out to uh, Mark Henry Ministry, and Jan and I will take care of all the accounting with that. Well, let me pray for us. Father, again, I'm just thankful for your calling in our lives. God, thanks for bringing us together as a family, seeking the Lord Jesus tonight. And God, I just pray that the 400,000 folks that have been reached in the past, that their hearts would be blessed. And we think of potentially two or 300,000, even from this event tonight, over the following weeks, that their hearts would be touched. God, thank you for letting us serve the Lord Jesus Christ together. We pray it in his name. Amen. For a hundred years, the Ten Boom family had lived and worked in this house. It was indeed a happy place. But now, the lights had gone out over Free Holland. Papa, are you going out? I will not gather around this house and do nothing. I'd rather do anything else. I'd like to close the door and never open it again until this whole hideous thing is over. Watched on every side, they were now embarking on an adventure that could cost them their lives. Thank you for the delivery, Mr. Smith. Papa, now! Better not send us anyone wider than me. It was 1944 when the Gestapo came. Hiding Place is a film you'll never forget. From the best-selling book comes this true story of innocence and hatred, of light in the midst of darkness. It's not a rest camp. Roll call 430 every morning. Seven days a week. Tomorrow, assignment to work details. Those who cannot work, report to sick call. But they had better be sick. <gasps> who could live in such a place? Driven by a power that would tear out all hope from the soul of man. You must believe you were God smells that stench from those chimneys and refuses to do anything. If only you could know his love. And why do you think you, a god of love, sent you here? Was it a secret room or a place <laughs> hidden deep in the heart of man? The hiding place. Tonight we have Corey Ten Boom with us and she's gonna share her personal story. Let's welcome Corey. Good evening. I bring you greetings from Holland. I have many things to talk with you. I get them here. I like to start with a poem. And this poem tell something of my life and maybe something of your life too. My life is like a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He worketh steadily, sometimes in foolish pride I forget. He sees the upper and I, the underside, 
not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hands as those threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. I have come with this message that God has no problems with our lives, only plans. And everything that happened to us is a preparation for the work we will do next. I, our home in Holland, we called Beye, and it was a happy place. And when I was five years old, I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he just came. He didn't say, no, you are too little. No, he just came, and that was many years ago. And I can tell you that he has never left me. Our home was a happy place, and the reason for the happiness in the Tin Boom House was that we believed that the Lord would always be with us. We spoke each day to Jesus. It was like he was a member of the family. So it was so natural to me that I would ask him into my heart when I was young. I will tell you that Father and mother liked to invite in anyone that was in need. So the Bay A was always full with people. Mother liked to have people stay to eat with us. And she would say, you can always put a little more water to the soup and there will be enough. <laughs> and there was, it was happy place. Father had the family together every day to read the Bible and to pray. And father also liked to study languages. So he read the Bible in different language. He would give Betsy, my older sister, the German Bible to read from. And my brother Willem, Willem liked the Hebrew. My sister Nolly, the French. But to me, father would give the English Bible. Now, I have not to go into details how that English Bible would help me in the work I would do in concentration camp and today as I travel the world. That training and language help us. S sometimes, we would find that we, we must do work. And the work at the Baye was to do for others. And on the street level of the Baye was a watch shop. And the Baye have been the Tin Boom House since 1837. That was the time that my grandfather would come there to make a watch shop. He was a watchmaker. Then later, my father was a watchmaker in that shop. Father was known as the best watchmaker in all the Netherlands. And I became the first licensed woman watchmaker in Holland. I worked 25 years shoulder on shoulder with my papa in that watch shop. And my older sister, Betsy, Betsy was never well. And so she remained at the Baye, and I also don't marry. And so I remain there too, and we divide the work that must be done. I would do the work in the shop, and Betsy would do the work in the house. But for 20 years, Betsy and I would work with the girl guides, and, and that was the young teenager girls, and we would play games with them and take them places, but we always bring them a Bible message. 
I remember the first time I teach a Bible message at my church. Already in five minutes, I was done. <laughs> and I know I must find a better way to do it. And so I asked my sister, Betsy. Betsy was seven years older than me and so wise. And so it would be Betsy who would teach me to tell those Bible stories as if I was painting a picture with my words. And I'd like to do it. And so I began another work. And that was my work with the feeble-minded. You do not need a big intellect to understand that Jesus loves you. And so it would be in that work that I would learn to tell the gospel in very simple language. And if you see one of God's special children, tell them that Jesus loves them, for they can understand it. At the time of the Second World War, there was only left at the Bayer father and his two spinster daughters, Betsy and me. And it was as early as 1925, Willem began to warn us of the dangers that the Jewish people was in in Germany. I remember father said, I pity the Germans that they have dared to touch the apple of God's eye. But that is what happened. When the Nazis descend upon Holland under their leader, Adolf Hitler, that Nazi propaganda machine was spewing out its poison. They said, we are here to help you. At first, it was not so bad, but then we slowly began to see that our friends, the Jewish people, was disappearing. They intended to kill all the Jewish people. The tin booms could not stand idly by and let this happen. We took a decision, and we began to be part of the Dutch underground workers. It was, it was exciting work. At one time, I had a group of 40 teenager boys, 30 teenager girls, 20 men, and 10 women who helped me. And we heard there was 100 Jewish babies in an orphanage in Amsterdam, and they was to be killed. So my teenager boys stole those babies. <laughs> You might ask, how is that possible? I will tell you a secret. Sometimes there would come to the Beye a good German soldier, and he would say, I don't want to work anymore for Adolf Hitler. Can you help me? And I would bring him in and give him civil clothing, and I kept the uniforms. Now, I have not to go into details how those uniforms would help those teenager boys steal 100 babies. <laughs> and my teenager girls did such a good work. If they came to your house and said, would you take a baby, people would say, no, 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 we have too many mouths to feed. But if that teenager girl has that baby in her arms and says, if you don't take this baby, and I cannot find it a home, it will die. And so in one day's time, those teenager girls found a home for 100 Jewish babies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to begin to take in the people that must hide. It was not only the Jewish people that must hide, because a Christian young man who was found on the street 
could be arrested and sent into Germany to work in those factories that make the guns and the bombs to kill the Allies. So that Christian young man that doesn't want to work in the factory must also hide. So the PA began to be filled again with people and, and the Jewish people that we could take in until we could find them a safe place in the country. And the underground sent to us a famous Jewish architect, and I, I bring him in, I, I show him the watch shop, and then we go up those stairs, I show him the parlor that is above it, and a few steps more to the dining room and the kitchen that is behind it. But he must see the whole house. So we continue up those narrow and ancient stairs, and I showed him each of those tiny rooms that was our bedrooms. And he have chosen my tiny bedroom at the top of the stairs, and he make the plans. And secretly we have that hiding place built. It was a false wall, a wall that would leave a narrow space from the outside wall of the house. It was big enough that six people could be behind it some could be up, but some must be down. And to get into that space, there was a panel in my closet. And if you get down on your knees and your hands, with your fingers you could raise that panel and they could crawl in that space and once they are inside with their fingers they can push it down that was, we must practice to see how quickly they could get into that space if they was hiding. And any person that was in the house that was hiding must be able to quickly get, gather up their clothing, a book, or any evidence of themselves they must quickly be able to gather that and go up those stairs and disappear in the hiding place. We had a buzzer and we would sound that buzzer and practice. If they could do it in two minutes time, we would celebrate. Sometimes we have cream puffs. <laughs> the real secret of that hiding place was the brick. It was exactly the same brick as on the outside wall of the house. So if you knock on that wall, you could not tell that it was not the outside wall. And the, because of that hiding place, the ten booms would help hundreds of Jewish people to escape those Nazi death camps until February 28, 1944. I was sick in my bed with a cold. My brother Willem was downstairs with a Bible study and the Bayer was full with people. And I would hear that buzzer and quickly beside my bed, there came the Jewish people and they disappear in my closet. Within minutes, the Gestapo have to send on the Baye, and they beat us. They knew there was a hiding place there, but we would not tell them, and they could not find it. Everybody in the house was taken to the police station. And that was the last time that I would see the face of my old father. 
father's friends would warn him, Caspar ten Boom, you will be put in prison for what you are doing. But father would always answer, I am too old for prison life. But for me, it would be an honor to give my life for God's chosen people. And that is what happened. In that police station with the, our family and friends around us, Father would read to us Psalm 91. We was all separated. And because I was sick, they put me for four months in solitary confinement, terrible suffering. I tried to sing to keep myself company, but they said, if you don't shut up, you shall also go to the, set, the cell with the cold water. So I could not even sing to keep myself company. For the first time in my life, I was really alone. I made friends with those tiny ants that crawl on my floor. One day in that cell, I had a wet rag and I was wiping on that filthy floor and my friend, the ant, became afraid and it ran to its hiding place in the wall. I heard God speak in my heart, that ant, does not look at its weak feet or the danger that it is around. It run only to its hiding place. Corey, I am your hiding place. And when you are afraid, you will run to me. And in that cell, I began really to know what I had heard all my life, that God is my hiding place. After four months, the prisoners was loaded onto trains and taken to another prison in Holland. But the great joy was, I was reunited with my sister, Betsy. Betsy was seven years older than me and so wise and, and we was together again. Betsy have such great faith. And I prayed many prayers in that cell. I prayed, Lord, don't let them take us out of Holland. But we was loaded into cattle cars and driven deep into the heart of Germany to Ravensbrück. That was a camp for where 96,000 women were killed or died. Also my sister. To get into that camp, each prisoner was searched and I had a tiny Bible, Old and New Testament, but very small, and it was on a string on my back under my dress. But I know if they find my Bible, I could be killed. And so I prayed, Lord, send your angels that you may protect your word. But then I think, Angels are spirits, and you can look through a spirit. Oh, God, don't let your angels be transparent today. <laughs> you can pray very unorthodox when you are in great need. And I tell you that he did it. He did it. They would search that woman that was in front of me, and they searched my Betsy who was behind me, and they doesn't even see me as I go into that prison with my Bible. 
Betsy and I were put in barracks 28. That was a, a room that they had made for 200 women. And they crowd in that room 700 women. And if they'd all been working, there was six toilets for everyone. The lack of hygiene was one of our greatest suffering. And if we got a chance for a hot shower, such a blessing. But we was told that's also the gas chamber. They would crowd us into a room and a hundred spigots of water would come from the ceiling. But we don't know today, does it come water or does it come gas? At such a moment, you look death in the eye. We were standing on the door to eternity. Barracks 28 was a place filthy with lice and fleas. Betsy said, we shall thank God for everything. I said, Betsy, I cannot thank God for lice and fleas. But she did. Have you heard of that blessing of the lice and the fleas? I will tell you. In some days, ways, that was a blessing because those German officers don't want to get lice and fleas in their uniforms. And so for that blessing of the lice and the fleas, they would leave us alone in barracks 28. And Betsy and I would do what we had done for years, and that was bring a Bible message. And our training in language would help us because there was women there from many countries with many language. But one prisoner could translate for another. Every day, as many as 600 women went to the ovens. But many women went to their death with Jesus' name on their lips because of the blessing of the lice and the fleas. One day in that camp, I was complaining to Betsy. I said, Betsy, I have caught a cold. I just cannot stand it today. She said, we shall pray. Dear God, please send Corey a hanky for she's caught a cold. <laughs> and I did what you did. I smiled that she would pray for such a thing. But in a few minutes, I heard a knock at the window that was beside me and it was my friend, the fellow prisoner. And she, I said, have you come for a visit? She said, no, no, I have something for you. And she passed through that window, a tiny package, and in that package was a hanky. Yeah. I said, why did you bring this? And she said, I was in a prison hospital. I find an old sheet and I was making hankies and something in my heart said, take a hanky to Corey Ten Boom. Now that's the foolishness of God. But nothing is too small for God's love. Do you know what that hanky told me? That hanky told me there was a God in heaven who had heard an impossible prayer and he was answering it for another one. Betsy and I, all the prisoners must, there was only a few inches to sleep on. And I sleep so close to my Betsy, I can feel her heartbeat. And I know it's not beating so good. And if one, prisoner would turn over, then the others must also turn over. We sleep like spoons in a box. And one morning, Betsy put a coat over our head. And she said, Corey, 
God have told me we shall be free soon. Yes, before the new year. And we will travel the world and tell people there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. And they will believe us because we have been here. I, I believed my sister, but Betsy was slowly starving to death. We was put outside so early in the morning, really in the midst of the night, and it was so cold. And the prisoner must stamp her feet to keep warm, and Betsy was too weak. And when she could no longer walk, we had to take her to the prison hospital. They would not let me stay with her. Betsy died there, and that was the darkest day of my life, for I could not understand what is God's plan. But in a few days' time, on roll call, I heard my number, 66,730. I think, is this my day for the ovens? I was not afraid to die. But when I reported, they said, you are released. So quickly, I thought, I said, what about my sister? We were in on the same charges, and they did not know she had died. And they said, your sister must remain here for the duration of the war. So I said, may I remain with her? And they said, not one minute, get your things and go. And then I began to understand a little bit of God's plan for I could not have left that place with Betsy still alive. But Betsy was already with the father. So I left that prison, a weak and sick old woman, and I would find out later. In two weeks' time, they had killed all the women of my age, and I had been released on a clerical error, a blunder of man, but a miracle of God. God opened that door that no one can shut. And I made my way back to Holland. I continued to wake up in those early morning hours, just like on roll call. And so I began to write my first yet book, A Prisoner and Yet because even though we was prisoners, we experienced so much of the love of God. And when the war was over, I decided to do what Betsy have told me. I, have, I call myself a tramp for the Lord, and I would go to any place to tell my story. I came first to America. I like America, and I like to tell my story. But in a little time, I felt a little distance from God. Now I know it cannot be something wrong with the shepherd, must be something wrong with the sheep. And so I ask God, what is wrong? And I hear in my heart one word, Germany. I never want to go back to Germany, but the Germans are not my enemies. I said I will go. And there was many people in Germany suffering and much work for me to do there. I remember the time I was in Berlin and there came a man to me and he had a very familiar face. And those guards beat us. He was one of the most cruel of the guards. And they had beaten my Betsy until she became deaf in her ear because she was too weak to work. Oh, there was hatred in my heart. But that man came to me and he said, 
I have asked God to forgive me for what I've done, but I also ask him if I could ask for forgiveness from one of my very victims. And I read in the paper you would be here, and so I have come to say, Fräulein Tin Boom, will you forgive me? Oh, there was hatred in my heart, but I know Romans 5.5, 5, that already we have some experience of the love of God shed abroad in our heart. So I said, God, give me that love that I may forgive this man. And exactly at that moment, like electricity that came through my arm, and I was able to take that man's hand and say, brother, I forgive you everything. Is that Corey Ten Boom love? No, that's God's love. It remind me of that poem of John Bunyan. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives you neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids you fly, but gives you wings. Isn't that good? And I had found out that there was a man named Jan Vogel who had betrayed me. I, I did not know about it, but my friend from my hometown told me. And after the war, he was a quisling, a traitor, and he was in prison and sentenced to die because he had caused the death of many Dutch people. So I wrote to him a letter. You have caused me much personal suffering and you have caused the death of four of my family members, but I have forgiven you because I am a Christian. And I know that you are to be uh, killed soon, but you could ask God to forgive you for what you have done and ask Jesus to be your savior. And you could go to one of those many mansions that Jesus have gone to prepare and I sent him that New Testament with that way of salvation underlined. I received back from that man a letter, oh, that your God could allow you to forgive me. I must also accept him. Now, God had used me who had hated that man to bring that man to himself. God can do anything. And forgiveness is a great joy. It breaks those chains of bitterness and those shackles of selfishness and the handcuffs of hatred. And the Bible is very clear. If you do not forgive, you have no forgiveness. But the great joy is he gives you the love that he demands of you. I shall end my message to you with a simple illustration. I have here a glove. And I say, what can this glove do? The glove can do nothing. But if my hand is in the glove, can do many things, can cook, can write, can play the piano. Well, you say, that's not the glove, that's the hand in the glove, and that is so. I tell you, we are nothing but gloves. And the hand in the glove is the Holy Spirit of God. This Bible is almost bursting with good news, but the most happy of the commandments is be filled with the Spirit. And I have come with the message that everything that happened to us is a preparation for the work we will do next. And I say to you, be filled with the Spirit so you can do the work God has planned for you. Hallelujah and amen.
That is an amazing story. I mean, you think about the Corey Ten Boom family, the whole family. They didn't play it safe. They followed Jesus. And friends, I pray that tonight, as you've heard that story, your heart will be challenged and encouraged. When I trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I started hearing uh, stories like the Ten Boom story, I remember one day sitting in church, and they started to sing this song. Maybe you've heard this song. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to say, uh, face? Must I not stem the flood while this vile world is a friend to grace to help us on to God? Since I must fight if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord, I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by your word. Let's meet our actress. Give this lady a hand. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just going to ask a few questions here of Evelyn. And, uh, and by the way, this entire presentation, you'll be able to watch online. Uh, in a few days, be edited markhenryministries.com. Now, the screen it was .org, but I think it's .com. Um, and olivetreeviews.org. Just go to video. So once it's edited, two, three, four days. So you can send the link and have others appreciate uh, the message of the evening. But Evelyn, what on earth possessed you to do what you do. Now, in, in Israel, they'd call you likely a righteous Gentile in that uh, you're obviously, um, you're impersonating someone who was indeed a righteous Gentile, Corey Ten Boom, but, but why you? I mean, you're a gal who hails from Kansas City and Tulsa and now Dallas, and what got into you to want to do this? Well, I discovered about 23 years ago, I had a particular talent to portray old women. <laughs> and I was praying to God, what can I do for you? You've done so much for me. And so I thought, well, if that's something I'm good at, then I need to do something at my church. And I, it just came to me that I would do Corey Ten Boom. I had portrayed another woman, and I had a costume that I could I could make this work, and I just read another book about Corey Ten Boom. Corey became like a spiritual grandmother to me through her book each new day, but I read everything I could read about her, and so I, I was going to do it at my church, and um, I knew that it was a ladies' retreat, and I knew the ladies would love the story. It's such a great story. and. But something happened that I never even thought of. They thought I really was Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> I even signed autographs. Now, we were in a church. I didn't want to lie, so I did sign Evelyn Hines as Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> but that's how I got started. But I thought I was only going to do it once. And how many times have you done it? I don't know, but it has been 23 years. 23 since. years. Okay. Wonderful. Evelyn, which, which of the, yeah, give her a hand for sure. I mean, Corey had an amazing life, amazing faith journey. God showed himself strong in so many ways for the whole family. If there's one of the instances that has impacted you the most, which would it be? Well, I do think a lot about that hanky that it doesn't matter what you are praying for. It can be something pretty little and God hears. Um, but there are so many. Yeah. And um, when, when she was like a spiritual grandmother to me, I had a lot of problems. I was a young woman with a lot of problems. And, but as I read her story, I was going, well, you aren't in a, I would said to myself, you aren't in a concentration camp. Corey made it, you can make it. And so that was what kept me, it helped me put my problems into a perspective and to persevere. And that's so important because all of us have gotten to the point in times in our life where it's like, I can't take anymore, I'm losing my mind, I'm going insane, right? Remember that right there. 
God was with Corey in a situation that you will probably never experience. God's grace was sufficient for her. God's grace will be sufficient for us. Amen. Yeah. Yes. You know, some of the things Mark was sharing tonight is, and myself as well, is history seems to be repeating itself. And we've had a few conversations about that, and, and Mark brought that out, I thought, brilliantly as far as some of the parallels. That, how do you feel when you see history repeating? And, and we've had a few conversations and emails talking about this. Why don't you share your thoughts? Well, um, it was through Corey's story and how God has led me along that I began to understand, um, along with some great teaching. Uh, I had a great mentor who taught me about the loving the Jewish people. And what I see that is so sad to me today is people do not know that as Christians, we're supposed to love the Jewish people. They don't know this. Um, they don't know who the Jewish people are. They have no regard for them. And uh, they certainly don't understand the Jewish roots of the faith. So those are things that, you know, whatever we're into, um, it's going to get worse when you don't understand those things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the church is um, a wall on, I think, on this topic. Many churches, not all. Um, and, and that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing tonight. And, and praying, too, that it can get replicated and duplicated and spread around the world maybe electronically so uh, a message like this could, could catch catch on. Yes, I totally agree, by the way. And, and you know what's sad about that is the Abrahamic covenant promises that those who bless Israel yeah. will be what? Blessed. blessed. And those who curse Israel will be cursed. cursed. It's that simple. And so why love Israel? Because God loves Israel, the apple of his eye. And if you want a blessing, I mean, who doesn't want a blessing from God? I mean, only a crazy person would say, I don't want a blessing from God, right? So to bless Israel, to love the Jewish people, to care for them, uh, that's how you get a blessing from God. That's one of the great blessings from God. Mm -hmm. If there is a primary thing that you would like folks to take away from this evening, what would it be? Well, I think um, Corey's message is that she was not young and she was not wealthy, and yet she and her family intervened to help the Jewish people. That's a message all of us need to know. Um, we, we may be called upon to, um, you know, the Tim Boom family said they took a decision and that's what it's going to need possibly in the future for all of us to take a decision. And uh, so I think that's so important. And also that Abrahamic covenant. I mean, I could go into hundreds of churches and you would scarcely find any that knew about the Abrahamic Covenant. Um, Mark, so, what has happened to the church, honestly, in 30 years? What's changed? Well, there's a couple of things that have happened. One is, uh, quite honestly, uh, churches are led by now, a lot of times, by people who have never gone to Bible college and seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, lots of the fastest growing churches are led by people who have business backgrounds, not theology backgrounds. That's one problem. Another problem is, is that many of our Bible colleges and seminaries no longer actually te teach Bible classes. Um, when I went to Bible college, we literally studied every single verse in the whole Bible. Every single verse. And I, I've met guys in ministry and they say, wow, you went through every verse in Daniel? Well, that makes a difference when you do that. You did every single verse in the book of Revelation. That makes a difference. And then when you do it with a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation and you apply it to every book of the Bible, whether it's Genesis 1-1 or Revelation 20, you come to some very clear conclusions that there's a God in heaven who created everything. Sin comes into the world. God in his grace is planning to save a people for himself. He calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 he tells us the channel by which redemption would come. It's going to come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
It's going to come through Judah. It's going to come through the line of David. Uh, this is what Christmas is about. We, we celebrate the first advent. But the story of Jesus doesn't stop at Christmas, and it doesn't stop at the cross. Salvation comes at the cross. But he's right now in heaven interceding for us, and he's coming back in glory, power, and majesty, and he's going to keep his promises to Abraham that those people who had those three responsibilities, the book, the Savior, and to be a light to the Gentiles, they will have their reward in the promised land just like God said. So bless them. If you'd like to communicate, remember she's got a website, evelynhines.com, and please feel free to write and encourage whatever, or invite her to your church. Um, and one more thing I want to say, and that is folks viewing and in attendance, you have no idea what the crew here at Revived Church goes through to put these presentations on, and I just hope you'll thank them as you, as you leave tonight. Yeah. Well, ladies, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for encouraging us as God's people. And would you do me a favor, just give these ladies a hand one more time. I don't know what difficulties and hardships await you this next week. I have no idea what uh, regulations are coming, what sort of mandates are coming, but what I do know is this, is that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. 